I'll answer the question. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Welcome back to Thinking Critical. This is Wes, and I've been reporting on the financial issues that Disney and AMC have been experiencing during the current uh, worldwide crisis. And today we're going to dig into the, the numbers and maybe uh, talk about a little bit more of the issues in depth. And joining me today is my good friend, Nalo. How are you doing, buddy? Excited here to talk about this interesting topic and how it overlaps with uh, you know the movies and comics we all love and uh, some interesting financial news. Let's be honest. Virtually every sector of the economy is getting hammered by this crisis. Of course, here on Thinking Critical, we definitely focus more on comic books, entertainment, you know, comics related entertainment, things of that nature. So Disney is a, is a really big one and something very interesting happened uh, this last week. And I want to read it from The Hollywood Reporter. I'm not going to read the whole article. Wells Fargo analyst Stephen Cahall has downgraded Walt Disney's stock in a Tuesday report that forecasts the studio's theme park division will take two years to return to normal attendance in the coronavirus pandemic era. Quote, we don't think parks can get back to anything close to full capacity until testing and or vaccines are far more ubiquitous, Cahill told investors. He downgraded the Disney stock to equal weight from overweight with a price target of $107. The Disneyland Resort and Walt Disney World Resort are closed indefinitely amid the uh, coronavirus crisis, and Walt Disney executive chairman Bob Iger on Tuesday said talks are underway about best practices when the North American theme parks can reopen. So this is kind of one of the underlying assumptions that I think a lot of people have had about Disney Yes, virtually everything that they do to make money is at a standstill right now. Theme parks can't be open. Cruise lines are shut down. People can't go to movie theaters. Literally, the only thing they have going right now is Disney+. Plus. And we are going to talk about that because there was some great news on that front. But I don't think that people are just going to be clamoring to go in mass out to these theme parks, even when they do get open, because there's going to be a lot of fear. There's going to be... I think consumer psyches are going to be permanently affected by this. Well, maybe not permanently, but affected long term by everything they're experiencing right now. Uh, yeah, I agree. And I think it was quite interesting. We were discussing previously uh, how almost every aspect of Disney's business has become a liability given this post COVID world. And, you know, that might be something that affects how business go operates going forward. And so that's everything from cruise ships, uh, hotels, amusement parks, movie theaters, and then even further, sure, we have Disney Plus and some positive um, aspects there, but they can't actually film new material because uh, film sets are also closed. Uh, sporting events with ESPN. So it's just kind of crazy how this one event can kind of uh, really decimate all of Disney's business avenues and that all of them are going to have to be rethought going forward. Well, certainly they're going to want to diversify their company and, and uh, mitigate the risk and put it in some other areas because... You know, other entertainment giants like AT&T, you know, being a communications company, you know, they have that Time Warner uh, aspect to it. So they're more diversified as far as the uh, as far as the areas that they provide actual products in. Whereas Disney is so focused on entertainment that something like this is basically just taking them down. And I'm not sure if it's actually still the same, but Netflix's stock prices actually were greater than Disney's. And you think about that, Netflix is only a streaming company, really, whereas Disney is an entertainment empire. Yeah, it's almost like Netflix was ahead of the curve. Um, most people kind of loathe how they just pump out content after content after content. And in this kind of scenario, uh, Disney Plus or anybody else is probably envious that they can't, they don't just have all this content to pump out because everyone's sitting at home and wants to watch it. And from the stock's point of view, um, we go by market cap. So what is like the total number of all the stocks that exist times their price. And so the market cap of Netflix actually was higher than Disney's, which for me is kind of jaw dropping because Netflix is a young company compared to Disney. They provide only one service. And in theory, Disney is completely diversified in that, you know, they can go on roller coasters, you can watch a movie, you can go on a cruise. And just the fact that the markets were pricing Netflix as a higher valued company than all of that kind of legacy and empire just really speaks to these times. Disney has had to do a lot of things to, uh, to, as far as reorganizing. They're starting to furlough people. All of their executives have taken pay cuts recently you know, to kind of extend some of their money out. But they weren't exactly a cash-heavy company to begin with because of their recent acquisition of Fox, 
which was enormous. And uh, they had to, you know, go into debt on that one. Not quite as much as AT&T did in, to end up getting Warner or Time Warner in, into the fold. But, you know, they're borrowing money just to, to cover cost right now. Yeah, that's really true. And it is actually kind of systemic because uh, AT&T also went into, you know, so much debt um, when they purchased Time Warner itself and kind of speaks to the nature of these large companies. And they actually rely on selling their debt in the kind of bonds market. And because everything's taking such a hit, we've kind of now seen unprecedented announcements from the uh, U.S. Federal Reserve where they're actually going to buy these bonds themselves to kind of help prop up these kind of zombie-esque companies that don't really have cash coming in. They're a lot of debt, and this is unprecedented times. So it seems like everyone's getting a lifeline who is a big company in that, that sense, but doesn't exactly translate to being able to get the parks open or getting to be able to film new movies anytime soon. Like we said, all the Disney Plus and the Disney films that were in production, they've all been halted. There's there's nothing you know coming off the assembly lines right now. And as far as their movies go, they have movies that are finished, but there are no theaters to actually release them in. You know, unless they want to bypass that theatrical release. And in the case of something like Black Widow, we're talking at least seven, eight hundred million dollars just in you know box office receipts. You know, and it wouldn't be all of that. They they only get a chunk of it. But they would have to bypass that just to go into Disney Plus or a video on demand service. So they're basically at a standstill with all this stuff. So a couple of years ago, after the AT&T acquisition of Time Warner, after the Disney acquisition of Fox, and you saw these super mega conglomerations as far as entertainment industry goes, it felt like all these companies were going to keep consuming each other until there was only maybe like two or three enormous entities left. But I think with what we have seen now, some of these acquisitions aren't going to feel quite as smart. And I think we might see an, a halt to that that idea that they're just going to be mega corporations moving forward. Yeah, I, kinda, I hope so, because uh, it was kind of an alarming trend as a consumer when you're running out of options and everything is controlled by one company. And the one that for me seems like pretty regretful is this Fox acquisition. I don't really know. Uh, what they really get out of that in the sense that the Fox IPs don't really gel well with Disney to the pack to the point where they put all that content on a whole different platform. So you have Hulu uh, with like the Fox IPs, then you have the pristine Disney Plus with uh, the Avengers and Pixar, et cetera. And so the brands don't even work well together that the fact they have to separate them out. So maybe we'll start to see uh, instead of a trend of acquisitions, maybe uh, some sales and some breaking up of this content you know, ultimately that hopefully leads to more choices for consumers. And the interesting thing about uh, Disney putting all that Fox material on Hulu, which actually would be kind of good for parents that have Disney plus there's all this content that's been built up over years that is ready made for children to go and consume. It's new to them. There's not really a lot of stuff there for parents, but they moved over to Hulu, but you know, they, they have a controlling interest in Hulu and I believe it's 60%, but you know, Comcast also has a has a large stake in Hulu as well, so they get to take home some of the uh, some of the revenue that's generated there. I also just think I think you discussed it on a previous video, but it's just like uh, yes, Disney Plus is hitting milestones in terms of subscribers, but they just were not prepared in terms of content. Uh, you could argue, hey, this is just a kids only platform. We have tons and tons of cartoons and old movies, uh, but for the people that were drawn for the Mandalorian, which was just you know a standout show, especially for a streaming service. Uh, and really gave us a uh, Star Wars universe and uh, really high definition kind of filming and plot went viral. It's been already close to half a year since it ended. So what is on deck uh, for me as a consumer? I actually uh, canceled my subscription because there's nothing left for me to watch. Um, I don't want to go back and watch old things personally. If I had kids, I'm sure they would love it. But they didn't have anything lined up and they didn't, weren't really prepared. And so maybe HBO Max will have a lot more ready. And you know Disney's going to have to scramble to get this more content flowing especially with like a Netflix uh, pushing new content. There's now Apple TV with a bunch of shows. Now people are recommending me. I uh, even uh, know Amazon. There's a bunch of fans of shows there. So the arena is heating up. And if Disney is really relying on that, like they just hit this 50 million subscriber mark and their stock rallied, if that's really what they're going to require for their stock to go up and down in the, in the future, uh, they don't have the content to really back it at the moment. And HBO Max is absolutely ready for this. They have a ton of content uh, ready made and it's going to be, uh, delivered when that uh, service goes online, but uh, you're absolutely right. You know, Disney Plus, lots of great content for kids. It'll be new to them, but there's almost nothing original available anymore. The Mandalorian's out. 
Uh, I have heard reports. I guess the, the second season of The Mandalorian already finished uh, – of recording, but there, it hasn't been processed yet. But all those MCU shows, the the ones that were driving people, you know, your Falcon Winter Soldier, your WandaVision, all those productions are halted, and you don't even know when they're going to come out. And 50 million subscribers is a huge mark. That's They're way ahead of schedule. But some of those subscribers got free subscriptions. We know that they offered them here in the U.S. if you got Verizon. A lot of those have been packaged up with ESPN Plus and Hulu, I know they just got a, a bunch of new subscribers from India, and they're opening up the Asian markets as, as well as Europe. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what uh, what they're offering there, but I'm sure it's similar to the U.S. as well. So I don't know. I don't. I definitely don't think it's 50 million paid subscribers. Although that it is going to be a huge number. Yeah, it's unlikely that they're all paid. Um, but to me, just like knowing a bit of the kind of financial and business world, uh, it's all about let's show the boardroom number going up. Let's tell the public numbers going up. And, you know, the headline uh, just from the other day is how, you know, will Disney up or serp Netflix? Because, you know, now they have like equivalent amount of uh, viewers or even more. And so they're trying to create this narrative for the public that, look, we have all this momentum. We have unprecedented number of subscribers. Our stock is now rebounding because of this. But over time, you know, if you don't really have the content to back that, it's uh, ultimately meaningless. So I'm very kind of attuned to these short-term games that they play with the press and the numbers to try and, you know, make the stock go up. And as we see, I think last week, the stock market had the greatest week since the 30s. And at the same time, unemployment is at the highest ever. So there is kind of a disconnect between whatever the stock's going on with it and are the parks actually open, are the cruises actually open, or the employees actually back to work. Well, if they had come into the streaming market 15 years ago with the material they have now, they would have absolutely destroyed Netflix because of the their Disney properties and, and things like that. But people don't expect just great shows like nostalgia from their streaming service anymore. They expect original new content. And, you know, Netflix is certainly at the forefront of that. Let's be honest. I think Netflix subscribers right now is like 123 million. So Disney has a little ways to go to catch up, but they certainly made a lot of ground. And they would be so much better off if they had that content waiting there to capture people and keep them. Because there, I, I know a lot of people that are in your your shoes where they've already dropped the service. There are probably a lot of parents right now that are holding on because everyone's quarantined right now. But what happens when their kids can go outside and do something else with their time? Is it really worth their money anymore? Just for me, at least, and many of my colleagues, uh, streaming is all about kind of binging. Like when mm -hmm. this new shade came out, and we're, we're stuck at home or... There's a blizzard, or in this case, there's a quarantine, and uh, we just don't want to get off our couch. We want to keep watching the next episode. And that's just not something you can do uh, unless you really want to go back and go on a nostalgia trip. So one of the last things I want to talk about, we, we hit on a little bit as far as um, acquisitions. Companies that went on big acquisition sprees, dropped a lot of their liquid assets, and then added on an enormous amount of debt to acquire some of these companies, like a Disney did with with uh, Fox, you know, of course, AT and T also did with Time Warner, and we we talked about a little bit on the channel a couple of days ago with AMC theaters acquiring acquiring Carmike and some other theaters uh, in Europe and in, in the U.S. as well, so they could be the world's largest theater chain. And they just don't have a lot of liquid assets, but they have a lot of like lease obligations and other obligations and and interest payments that are coming due. This crisis is absolutely decimating them. It's taking all their liquid assets out and it, it's really exposing the, the folly of these short term, I will consolidate a ton of debt onto me so I can expand into markets uh, w without really having the capital on hand to, to be able to weather a storm. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of companies are gonna be regretting that uh, and kind of just running these kind of deficits and large amounts of debt and I know it's a little bit outside the realm of, uh, you know, what this channel usually covers, but it's to me fascinating just the systemic uh, nature of how all these things are intertwined, where you have mortgages on commercial real estate for all these new theaters that they uh, purchase, then they don't have new movies coming in, so they have no revenue. Those movies aren't actually even able to be filmed. So, you know, we talk about in comics, when are we going to get them? Might take till July for the shipping to start. It's kind of going to be the same sort of backlog with content, because even if the theaters are open, uh, they don't have a, there might be a few movies they can release, but they're not actually currently filming and producing them. Those things take a year plus uh, leadway. And so you might have all these kind of even then real estate defaults because there aren't any Disney movies to show the audiences, even if they're open. 
Well, and like I said, there's going to be long-term effects on consumer psyches. How many people are willing to take their family into a crowded movie theater where they're sitting next to a lot of people they don't know? Yeah, it's going to take a lot of time for me to feel comfortable doing that personally. It's going to take probably a lifetime for me to want to go on a Disney cruise. <laughs> um, <laughs> and yeah, it's, it's damaging to the psyche. And even once this all passes over, I think habits are going to change. Yeah, I, I don't think the, the movie theater industry is is much like the comic book industry. I don't think it comes out the other side looking remotely the same. It's going to have to change. You know, I, I don't see, you know, a movie theater for every customer just right around the corner anymore. I think we're going to see uh, movie theaters become a little bit more scarce. What's being released and the, uh, theatrically is going to become more selective. It's going to be all big blockbusters with, with huge sound and all that mid-tier, mid-budget stuff that's kind of already been moving over to Netflix, I think you're going to see it all move permanently to Netflix, going to see it permanently on, on Disney+. Plus. And uh, we're probably not going to see a lot of original stuff for a while because these companies are going to be scared to put anything out there that isn't a moneymaker because they all just lost so much money. Yeah, and uh, you really have to take the global nature involved because I know with Disney specifically, they really rely on the Chinese box office. And um, one of the biggest hits to their economy, surprisingly, was how every movie theater got closed across the country during the lockdown. And that was during the Chinese New Year, where apparently a lot of people go to the movies. And now it was one of the first signs that things might not be completely open there because they, the first thing they shut down just last week was movie theaters again. So, you know, movie theaters are going to be one of the first things to close if, you know, we keep having these minor pop ups, even if we're all able to go back to work. Yeah, it's going to change habits. And um, on the other hand, they, we have those franchises like Alamo Drafthouse and a few others that are trying to make movie theaters more about experiences. And so maybe uh, if we get a little bit of that, it can kind of entice people to break their fear of sitting in a room of potentially sick people if they're being wined and dined quite literally. The movie theater has been moving from a, from a service industry to an experience industry. And I, I, don't, I don't see it going back the other way. I think you're going to have selective, really cool high-end, experience movie theaters you're going to have your imax where it's the visual and, and audio experience movie theater and I, I just don't see a lot of those uh, regular theaters being around anymore well there'll be some but you know it's definitely going to be scaled back up to a large extent and and what's going to happen with disney are they going to be able to operate all their parks coming out of this you know because they're, they're saying it's going to be two full years before those things can be operating at capacity again for before people are ready to go back Maybe the, maybe Disney doesn't have all their parks when it's all over either. Uh, yeah, unprecedented time, so we shall see. But um, definitely something to keep an eye on from the financial side of things, how this is going to play out uh, as we wait for new content. Yeah, so obviously we're, we're going to keep talking about this on the channel and covering it when, when new uh, information comes up. And, and hopefully Nalo here will, will join me uh, when we can talk about it. His, his time is limited. He mostly can record on the weekends, so you'll probably see stuff like this on a Sunday or a Monday uh, when it becomes available. Is there anything else that you wanted to say before we wrap this up? I just want to repeat that I, for me it was kind of jaw-dropping that Netflix was valued higher than the entire Disney empire. And you know, if you dig deeper, you see it's because of all these liabilities, the debt, and the acquisitions. And you know, it's interesting stuff, so I hope you guys enjoy this video. Uh, I'm certain that they will. Thank you very much, my friend.